Good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the newspaper dated 22nd January 2023. Displayed here are the list of articles that we will take up for discussion today. We will quickly get into the discussion. Before that, if you have not subscribed to our channel, kindly do it now so that you get instant updates. Now we will start with the first article discussion. This FAQ article is about the declining Chinese population. The article focuses on the reasons for current decline in Chinese population, the impacts of the declining population and the steps taken by the Chinese government to counter this trend and finally we will also see if there are any chance that these steps taken by the China would work. So this is the essence of the article. So in our discussion today, let us focus on demographic transition theory and then we will see the contents of this article in detail. So this discussion we are about to have falls under these parts of the syllabus. You can go through it. Now we will start by understanding what demographic transition theory is all about. So it is basically a population theory which focuses on the general relationship between birth rate, death rate and population growth rate as a country or a society moves from the pre-modern setup to a post-modern setup. So basically the theory focuses on the relationship between economic development of a country and the country's population. According to the demographic transition theory there are basically four stages. The first stage is the high stationary stage. Most pre-developed countries are present in this stage. India in the early part of the 20th century was in the high stationary stage. In this stage there will be high birth rates and high death rates. Both the birth rates and death rates of the population will be stable and there will be very slow growth. Countries in this stage are mostly agricultural in nature and they also follow primitive forms of agriculture. So basically people prefer to have more children as they see children as an additional source of labor in their farms. This is the reason for high birth rate. Also there is high death rate. This is due to the lack of modern healthcare facilities. So the high birth rate is compensated by high death rate and hence the population will be stable. The second stage is called as the early expanding stage. In the early expanding stage what happens is that the death rate starts falling but the birth rate remains the same. Due to higher birth rate in this period and rapidly falling death rate the population starts increasing rapidly. This stage is called as the population boom or population explosion. India was in the early expanding stage post independence. So in that period with the expansion of modern medical facilities the death rate declined rapidly. But since India was predominantly rural and mainly dependent on agricultural and also literacy was low so there was high birth rate. Due to this the population increased rapidly in India. Now the third stage is a late expanding stage. So in the late expanding stage the death rate stabilizes and the birth rate starts falling. But still the birth rate remains higher than the death rate. Due to this population will continue to increase but the rate at which the population grows slows down. The slowdown in the birth rate in this phase is due to increasing literacy rate, urbanization, people moving from agriculture, women empowerment and also because of the social engineering steps that are taken by the government. So now India is currently in the late expanding stage. Even though our population is growing, our population growth rate has slowed down. This is about the late expanding stage. The fourth stage is the low stationary stage. So in this stage, both the birth rate and the death rate will be low. Due to this, the population will be low and at the same time there will be a stable population. If you see the developed countries in the Western Europe, they have entered into the fourth stage. Their population has stabilized as the birth rate has matched the death rate. The next stage is the stage of population decline. In this stage, the birth rate falls below the death rate. Due to this, the population starts declining. Japan has been facing the issue of falling population for quite some time. The recent addition here is China which is also experiencing a decline in population recently. So this is about the demographic transition theory. 
Now let us see the content of this article. According to the China's National Bureau of Statistics, compared to 2021, if we see China's population has declined by 8 lakh 50 thousand in the year. This is significant because this is the first decline in the Chinese population since 1961. In 1961, China's population declined due to Mao Zedong's failed Great Leap Forward campaign. Now, what is the main reason for the current decline in China's population? See, China implemented the one-child policy in the 1980s. China's one-child policy was very harsh. People were forced to have abortions. For people who had more than one child, the government imposed heavy penalties. Due to such strict implementation, China was able to prevent 400 million births. It is the main reason behind China's falling population. The Chinese government implemented this one-child policy to reduce the strain on limited natural resources and reduce government expenditure. They were quite successful in controlling the population, but this policy backfired. It resulted in reduction in population, and now China is facing other problems. The first problem is the reduction in the working age population. In 2011, China's labor force was around 925 million, but in 2022, this has declined to 875 million. This is a major concern for China. This is because if you see at the Chinese growth story, the main reason why China became the global manufacturing hub is because of the availability of cheap and abundant labor force. But right now, the labor force is contracting, and at the same time, the wage rate is also increasing. Due to this, many MNCs are shifting their base to countries like India, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. This is affecting China's economic growth. The second major problem is increasing welfare-related expenses for the Chinese government. Due to the declining population, the Chinese population is rapidly aging. By 2050, the Chinese government estimates the above 60 population will account for as much as 35 percentage of the total population. According to China's National Working Commission on Aging, healthcare spending on this group will rise to 26 percentage of the GDP by 2050. This will put additional strain on Chinese expenditure. This is also a major worry for China. So, in order to address these issues, China started taking efforts from 2016. So, what they did was that in 2016 they abandoned the one-child policy. but the population still continued to decline this is because the people themselves did not wish to have more children because now it has become costlier to raise children due to increasing healthcare and education expenses so again in 2021 the chinese government introduced the three child policy it even announced incentive policies such as issuing subsidies to families with second or third child To address the economic factors such as healthcare costs and education expenses, the Chinese government has started taking many steps. For example, the Chinese government has recently started to crack down on the expensive private education companies. But even then, the population has not picked up. This is because globally itself there is a trend of personal preferences for smaller families. So according to this article the only solution at hand is rising the retirement age from the current 60 for men and 55 for women these are the lessons that india should learn from the most populous country because soon india will overtake china in terms of population so in this discussion we saw about the demographic transition theory then the reasons for the current decline in chinese population the impacts of the declining population and finally we saw some steps that were taken by the chinese government to counter this trend with these points in mind we will move on to the next article discussion look at this article from the faq page it is talking about india's plan to eradicate measles and rubella we know that india has set a target to eliminate measles and rubella by 2023 India has earlier missed the deadline of 2020 due to a variety of reasons that was also aggravated by the disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Before that also, the 2015 target was missed. When the government anticipated that the 2020 goal could not be reached, 
in 2019 a goal to eliminate measles and rubella by 2023 was adopted so for achieving this target the indian government has devised some plans and this article provides us with the details of india's plan to eradicate those diseases so in this discussion we will learn about measles and rubella and we will also try to understand the points provided in the article before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here have a look at it first we will understand about measles so measles is a airborne disease caused by a virus called paramyxovirus it's a highly contagious virus so by the term highly contagious virus i mean that the infection can spread from one person to another very easily therefore human to human transmission of measles infection is possible now how is it transmitted see measles can be transmitted through the droplets from the nose mouth or throat of the infected person to a healthy individual these droplets can spread the disease even when they are released in the air it can spread by the injection of the virus into the environment by sneezing or coughing so measles can be termed as a communicable disease now what are the symptoms of measles some of the symptoms of measles include fever cough and common cold measles can also lead to serious health complications such as blindness encephalitis diarrhea ear infection or even some severe respiratory infection such as pneumonia severe measles most likely occurs among poorly nourished young children especially those with insufficient vitamin a severe measles was also noted among children whose immune systems have been weakened by hiv or aids or any other disease this is why who calls this disease as a killer childhood disease now we will understand about the next disease which is rubella rubella is caused by the rubella virus it is also a contagious infection and it is spread through air by droplets from infected person to uninfected person note that humans are the only known host to rubella virus now talking about the symptoms of rubella rubella is said to be a mild infection so the symptoms includes rashes low fever and nausea in adults if you see women are getting affected more commonly they develop arthritis and painful joints when a woman is infected with the rubella virus early in pregnancy she has a 90% chance of passing the virus on to her fetus so this can cause miscarriage stillbirth or severe birth defects and this is called as the congenital rubella syndrome so know that This congenital rubella syndrome is an illness in infants that result from maternal infection with rubella during pregnancy. So with these basics now we will try to understand the points provided in this news article. First let us have an idea on why this 2023 target is crucial. According to WHO the measles virus is one of the world's most contagious human virus. It has killed more than 1 lakh children every year globally. Also WHO says that rubella is a leading cause of birth defects and this can be preventable by vaccine. Therefore, we can say that both rubella and measles can be prevented by just two doses of safe and effective vaccines. As per the WHO statistics, if we see over the past two decades, the measles vaccine is estimated to have averted more than 30 million deaths globally. That's why India is targeting to eliminate measles and rubella by 2023 and it is considered to be very crucial because under this target India is planning to boost the vaccination drive and it will help to eliminate both the diseases now we will understand what are the efforts that are taken so far to achieve the target a research paper titled progress towards measles and rubella elimination india 2005 to 2021 which was published on the center for disease control and prevention website explains the path that india has taken so far the paper says during 2010 to 2013 india has conducted a phased measles catch up immunization for children aged 9 months to 10 years So this drive was conducted in 14 states and it had approximately vaccinated 119 million children. Then India has another program which is Mission 
Indradhanush. This mission was launched in 2014 to ramp up the vaccination program for the unvaccinated population. Then, during 2017 to 2021, India adopted a national strategic plan for measles and rubella elimination. India introduced a rubella containing vaccine into the routine immunization program. India also transitioned from outbreak based surveillance to case based acute fever and rash surveillance. Know that India has also doubled the number of laboratories to test the measles and rubella. These are some of the efforts that India has taken so far. But are these efforts only sufficient to contain the disease of measles and rubella? Or simply to say, is the target to eliminate measles and rubella achievable? For this question, some experts and officials have provided some information. Now we will try to understand them one by one. Firstly, the insight was given by Dr. Jacob John. He is a noted virologist and is currently heading the India Experts Advisory Group for Eliminating Measles and Rubella. He says India's target to eliminate measles and rubella by 2023 is achievable. He noted that the main concern is the under one year population. But he also hopes that if India is able to keep up the tempo of two dosage coverage at 95% then it will be possible to achieve the target. He also pointed out that besides testing for measles and rubella, each district in India should be given a target to achieve the required rate of immunization then to conduct a robust fever and rash surveillance program. He said that this move will help to achieve the target. Secondly, the insight was given by C.S. Rex Argunam. He is the president of Tamil Nadu Health Development Association. He says that it is very important to provide full support to the ground level staff because they are the people who implement the vaccination program. Here, the ground level staffs might include the village health nurses, ASHA workers, Anganwadi workers and also the integrated child development service workers. He advocates that the government should improve the service condition of the staffs and the salaries must also be given without any delay. He further says the target will be easier to achieve in states such as Tamil Nadu and Kerala because such states are having robust immunization infrastructure. So therefore, to achieve targets in other states, additional efforts should be taken. Finally, we will also see what the WHO has to say regarding India's target. The WHO has expressed its hope that India could indeed reach the target. But the WHO pointed out that India should strengthen its surveillance by finding, investigating, collecting and testing samples of suspected cases in each and every district, every state and union territory. So this would help to understand the extent of the disease and for effective vaccination. So in this discussion, we first saw that we have set a target for 2023 to eradicate measles and rubella. We saw in detail what are the symptoms of measles and rubella, how it is transmitted. We also saw what are the actions or efforts that are taken so far. Then we also saw some way forward to eliminate the diseases. With these points in mind, we will move on to the next article discussion. Have a look at this science page article. It talks about the reasons for abnormally low temperatures which is now being reported in Ooty. See, Ooty is a hilly district in Tamil Nadu and it has experienced a steep fall in mercury this month. As the article reports, scientists have linked the fall in temperature with La Nina conditions in the Pacific Ocean. So in this discussion, we will see about how La Nina has caused a temperature dip in the southern part of Indian Peninsula. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. Have a look at it. See, there are three phases of variation of ocean temperatures in the southern tropical part of the Pacific Ocean. The first phase is called a neutral while the other two phases are called El Nino and La Nina. Firstly, let's see about the neutral phase of Pacific Ocean. So, in this phase, there is an accumulation of warm water in the western part of the Pacific Ocean. So, this is due to the trade winds in the tropical region. As we all know, the trade winds flow from east to west. 
the flow of this easterly winds result in the accumulation of warm water in the eastern Australian coast while cold water is accumulated near South America. This is what happens to the sea surface temperature in Pacific Ocean during normal or a neutral condition. Now we will move on to see about El Nino. See, El Nino is a condition in which easterly trade winds which flow from the east to west in the tropical areas of the Pacific Ocean becomes weak. Due to this, what happens is that the warm water starts to accumulate in the western margins of the South America. At the same time, the eastern Australian coast comes into contact with low temperature water. Here you should note one important point. Warm coastal water causes rain while cold coastal water causes flood. So this El Nino condition that we are discussing about results in drought in the eastern Australia while there is excess rainfall in the regions of western South America. This is about El Nino. The opposite of this phenomena is the La Nina. In a La Nina year, the trade winds are usually stronger which helps in accumulating the warm seawater in the eastern coast of Australia. This in turn results in the cold water accumulation in the western South America near the Peruvian coast. Normally, La Nina brings excess rainfall to Australia. This is because of the excess accumulation of warm water near the coast. The terms La Nina and El Nino strictly deals with the temperature difference in the ocean waters in the Pacific Ocean. So this is about La Nina. Now you should also know about a complementary phenomena to the El Nina which is shortly known as ENSO which means El Nino Southern Oscillation. Southern Oscillation is an atmospheric condition in which high pressure is reported in Australia while low pressure is reported in South America. As I said earlier, this phenomena results in droughts in Australia while it causes flooding in the Peruvian coast. So we can say that El Nino and La Nina are phenomena which are linked to the sea surface temperature only. While El Nino Southern Oscillation is a phenomena that is linked to both atmosphere and sea surface temperature. Before seeing what this news article says, you should know that this year is a La Nina year. So this article says that due to this La Nina phenomena only, Uti has been experiencing a below average temperature. The article says that La Nina event this year has caused the Siberian cold air mass to enter India and caused an extreme cold weather event in Uti. Here note that the Siberian high is responsible for the bitter cold of the tundra and has been known to affect the weather from Europe to Southeast Asia. This time, La Nina has helped this dry cold air mass to enter the southern peninsula of India, thereby causing a temperature fall in Wuti. The article further says that the La Nina winter plus a very strong Siberian high conspired to create a cooler than normal winter in South India. This has been further amplified by the withdrawal of the northeast monsoon from January 12. This has allowed the cooler dry land wind to strengthen in the southern part of a country. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we came to know about the sea surface temperature phenomena of El Nino and La Nina. We also learnt the reason behind the mercury dip in the district of Uti in Tamil Nadu. With these points in mind, we will move on to the next article discussion. Look at this news article. It is about the Ayushman Bharat School Wellness Program. So this article focuses on the difficulty in implementing the program. In this discussion, let us first see about the Ayushman Bharat scheme and then we will focus on the content of this article. See, Ayushman Bharat literally means healthy India. It is a national initiative launched as part of the national health policy of 2017. It was launched to achieve the vision of universal health coverage. So this initiative has been designed on the lines of sustainable development goal number 3. So this SDG goal number 3 is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being at all ages. Its vision is to provide a comprehensive need-based healthcare service. So it aims to undertake interventions to holistically address the health at primary, secondary and also at the tertiary level. Hence it covers prevention, promotion and ambulatory care or outpatient care on these levels. 
it comprises of two interrelated components the first component is establishment of health and wellness centers in this 1.5 lakh health and wellness centers will be established and this will bring health care closer to the homes of the people these centers will provide comprehensive primary health care and cover both maternal and child health services and also for non communicable diseases it also includes providing free essential drugs and diagnostic services the second component is the pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana or the national health protection scheme see it is a public health insurance or assurance scheme basically it aims to provide health protection cover to poor and vulnerable families so pmj provides financial protection by offering an insurance benefit cover of rupees 5 lakh per family per year in short it aims to reduce the out of pocket expenditure note that for availing the benefits of pmj there is no cap on family size and age this in turn ensures that nobody is left out of the mission this financial protection is provided to more than 10 crore families who are poor who belong to deprived rural families and to identified occupational categories of urban workers as per the latest socio economic caste census data these are some basic facts about the ayushman bharat mission now let us come to what this news article says as i already mentioned the news article talks about ayushman bharat school wellness program as we all know schools play a critical role in helping students establish lifelong healthy habits due to its importance school based health promotion activities has also been incorporated as a part of the health and wellness component of the ayushman bharat program so the ayushman bharat wellness program was launched in 2020 to be implemented in government and government aided schools in this program two teachers preferably one male and another female in every school are designated as health and wellness ambassadors these teachers are then provided training in health promotion and disease prevention on certain thematic areas the areas include emotional well-being interpersonal relationships responsible citizenship gender equality reproductive health hiv prevention safety and security against violence and also promotion of safe use of internet after getting trained these teachers then pass on the information to the school children in the form of interesting joyful interactive activities for this purpose one hour is allocated every week the initiative is also linked with other government initiatives such as fit india movement eat right campaign poshan abhiyan for all round and holistic development model of health for the school children the students after receiving training in these area later act as the health and wellness ambassadors for the society so overall this scheme looks very well rounded in the paper but still even after 3 years since it is launched there is only 50 percentage take up and so far only 15 states have started the weekly 40 minute classroom session with students the article highlights the reason behind this low penetration the first major reason is teachers at government school are overworked the second reason is not all states have allocated a weekly time slot in the classroom schedule to conduct these programs and the third main reason is that there is no formal reporting structure or accountability mechanism so there is no way to ensure that the syllabus is implemented in schools the last reason is that in most schools the teachers who are at the verge of their retirement are appointed as health and wellness ambassadors due to this it is difficult to train the ambassadors so with these points in mind we will move on to the next article discussion now look at this article here it says that there could be an alternative to the franklin rod the alternative is a powerful laser aimed at the sky now it is believed that the laser can create a virtual lightning rod and divert the path of lightning strikes the significance of this alternative is that it could pave the way for better lightning protection methods for critical infrastructure so this is about the news article given here in this discussion we will see what is the franklin rod and we will try to understand its working see franklin rod is nothing but the lightning rod you would have seen it on the top of large buildings which generally protects the building from lightning 
so it is an external terminal installed in a building or structure and the very purpose of this rod is to attract the lightning to have a controlled point of impact by doing this the rod basically prevents the lightning from striking unwanted area or people now let us see why the lightning rod is called as franklin rod it got its name from the famous scientist benjamin franklin he is widely recognized for his groundbreaking exploration of electricity one of the famous experiment is his kite experiment he assumed that clouds have electric charge and lightning was just a scaled up version of sparks and to prove this he blew a metal frame kite tied to a silk cord to which he had previously inserted a metal key and when the lightning struck he was able to observe that through the silk thread the electricity reached the key and electric sparks flew so he discovered that if the lightning strike found a metal contact on its way to earth then it would stay there and dissipate through this experiment he discovered the franklin rod now in order to understand the working of the franklin rod you must first understand how a lightning occurs see when a storm cloud develops in the sky strong winds move upwards through the cloud and make the water drops present in the cloud to rub against one another so when the water drops rub against one another the electric charge is produced due to the friction small water drops occur positive charge and since they are lighter they move to the upper part of the cloud on the other hand large water drops occur negative charge and since these drops are larger in size they come down in the lower part of the cloud now because of this the top of the cloud becomes positively charged whereas the bottom of the cloud becomes negatively charged when they accumulate enough charge it starts to flow with high speed through the air between them when the positive and negative charges of the cloud meet they produce an intense spark of electricity between the clouds in the sky this is what we call as a lightning lightning usually occurs within a cloud in the sky it is called sheet lightning lightning also occurs between a cloud and earth this is called fork lightning now if a storm cloud having negative charge at its bottom passes over a tall building then it induces positive charges on the roof of the building when the electric charge on the bottom of the cloud becomes extremely large then these tremendous electric charges present on the bottom of the charged cloud suddenly flow to the roof of the building and because of this we see a flash of lightning coming towards the building when lightning strikes a building its tremendous electric energy can set the building on fire or it can cause serious damage to the structure so for protecting the buildings from lightning we use the lightning rod what the lightning rod does is that it is basically connected to the ground through a wire the electric charge from the lightning strikes the rod and the charge is conducted harmlessly into the ground this protects the houses from burning down and people from electrocution so in this news article discussion we learned what is franklin rod we saw how a lightning occurs and we also saw the working of the franklin rod that's all i wanted to discuss regarding this news article now we will move on to the next article discussion look at this article here it says that the enforcement directorate has arrested the trinamool congress youth leader kuntal ghosh in connection with the west bengal recruitment scam here we are not going to discuss about this issue instead we will revise some facts about the enforcement directorate the directorate of enforcement or the ed is a multidisciplinary organization with investigation of economic crimes and violation of foreign exchange laws so it was established on 1st of may 1956 but initially it was not called as the ed it was formed as an enforcement unit under the department of economic affairs it was formed for handling exchange control laws violation under the foreign exchange regulation act of 1947 but in the year 1957 this unit was renamed as enforcement directorate and in 1960 the administrative control of the directorate was transferred from the department of economic affairs to the department of revenue so as i said earlier it investigates economic crimes and the violation of foreign exchange laws 
The statutory functions of Directorate include enforcement of the following acts. First, Prevention of Money Laundering Act of 2002, then Foreign Exchange Management Act of 1999, then Fugitive Economic Offenders Act of 2018, and finally Foreign Exchange Regulation Act of 1973. And these are some of the functions of ED. It collects, develops and disseminates intelligence relating to the violation of the Foreign Exchange Management Act of 1999. Then it functions to investigate the suspected violations of the provisions of FEMA 1999 relating to activities such as Havala Foreign Exchange Tracketing, Non-Realization of Export Proceeds, Non-Repatriation of Foreign Exchange and other forms of violation under FEMA 1999. And it also adjudicates cases of violation of the erstwhile FERA 1973 and FEMA 1999. It also realizes penalties imposed on conclusion of adjudication proceedings. It can handle adjudication appeals and prosecution cases under the erstwhile FERA 1973. It also functions to process and recommend cases for preventive detention under the Conservation of Foreign Exchange and Prevention of Smuggling Act. It undertakes survey, search, seizure, arrest, prosecution actions, etc. against the offenders of Prevention of Money Laundering Act offence. It not only provides but it can also seek assistance from the contracting states in respect of confiscation of proceeds of the crime and it can also ask for the transfer of accused person under the PMLA Act. So in this discussion, we revised a few points regarding the Enforcement Directorate. So with these points in mind, we will move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this dazzling picture here. The animal we see here is the Sambar deer. It was spotted in the Amrabad Tiger Reserve. So this Amrabad Tiger Reserve is present in the Nallamala Hills which is located in Telangana. From January 26, this reserve will be open for the tourists under the eco-tourism packages announced by the Forest Department of Telangana. So this is the crux of the news article. Now in this discussion we will understand about the Sambar deer. The scientific name of Sambar deer is Rusa unicolor. Sambar deer is a large deer native to the Indian subcontinent, southern China and southeast Asia. Note one important fact here, Sambar deer is the state animal of Uriza. Now we will understand its food habits. See, Sambar deer feeds on a wide variety of vegetation including grasses, fruit and water plants. But this depends on the local habitat in which it is surviving. They also consume a wide variety of shrubs and trees. Now we will see where they are distributed. Sambar deer are distributed in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, the Philippines, Southern China, Taiwan, Borneo, Malaysia, Sumatra and Java. They inhabit both gentle slopes and steeper parts of forested hillsides. Sampa deer prefers to live in tropical dry forests, open scrubs, tropical seasonal forests, mountain forests, broadleaf deciduous and evergreen forests. They seldom move far from water resources. These deer can also be found near cultivated areas like garden and plantation where they come to find food. Sampa deer faces certain threats. The first and foremost threat is hunting. Samba deer is hunted for sports, food, medicinal products and also for many other purposes. Then other threats include local insurgency, land fragmentation, degradation of forest lands which are caused by industrial exploitation of habitat and also deforestation. And now finally let us see about the conservation status of Samba deer. See Samba deer is listed as a vulnerable species under the IUCN red list of 300 species. In India, Samba deer is protected under the Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. With these points in mind, we will move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this front page article. It says that the centre has decided to nominate Assam's Chardo Moidams for the UNESCO World Heritage Site status this year. It is basically the home equivalent of the ancient Egyptian Brahmids. Moidams represent the late medieval Mount Burial tradition of the Thai Ahom community in Assam. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about the Ahom dynasty. The Ahom dynasty was a medieval kingdom in the Brahmaputra valley in Assam. It lasts from 1228 to 1826 
and it is called as the kingdom of Assam in medieval times. Also note that this kingdom successfully resisted the Mughal expansion in northeastern India. As far as the establishment is concerned, Ahom was established by Suhafa, a Thai prince from Mong Mao. Suhafa occupied a depopulated region near the Burhi Diheng River in the north, the Dihao River in the south and the Padhai Mountains in the east. He befriended the local groups, the Barahi and Marans and finally settled his capital at Charaidyo. Now in this map you can see the extent of the Ahom Kingdom. However, this kingdom became weaker with the rise of the Moa Mario rebellion and subsequently it fell to the succession of Burmese invasions. The Burmese were defeated by English in the first Anglo-Burmese war. As per the Treaty of Yendabo in 1826, the control of the kingdom passed into the British East India Company's hand. Now we will see some highlights of this empire. The Ahoms brought with them the technology of wet rice cultivation that they shared with other groups. Then they followed a system called as the Paika system. It was a compulsory labour service system introduced by the Momai Tamuli Barbarua under the patronage of Pradap Singh. Though it came to be called as the Ahom Kingdom, it was largely multi-ethnic. The kingdom had only 10% of ethnic Ahom people population towards the end. Then, the Ahom called their kingdom as Mong Dun Shun Ham. It means the casket of gold, but others called it Azam. The king under the Ahom kingdom is called Swargadeo. He should be a descendant of the first king Suhafa. Later, Pradap Singha added two officers, Barbarua and Barfukan. The Barbarua is the military as well as the judicial head, whereas Barfukan is military and civil command. Five positions of importance constituted the Council of Ministers. They were known as the Patra Mandris. These Mandris advised the kings on important matters of the state. So this is in brief about the Ahom Kingdom. Now we will move on to the next part of our discussion which is practice questions. For the prelims practice questions, we have five questions. Four will be discussed by me and one will be the quiz question for the day. Question number one. Which among the following are the means of protecting critical infrastructure and human beings? 1. Franklin Lightning Rod 2. Early Streamer Emission System 3. Charge Transfer Systems Which of the given statements are correct? See, Franklin Rod is not the only way to protect against the lightning strikes. There are other systems such as Early Streamer Emission Systems, Charge Transfer Systems. Early streamer emission systems closely resembles a lightning rod and works in much the same way. But the charge transfer system prevents the lightning from forming within the area of protection. So the correct answer to this question is option D, 1, 2 and 3. Question number 2. With reference to the sambar deer, consider the following statements. Statement number 1. It is native to Indian subcontinent. Statement number 2. It is the state animal of Andhra Pradesh. Statement number 3. It is characterized as endangered in the IUCN red list of threatened species. Which of the statements given above is RR incorrect? See, Sambar deer is a large deer native to the Indian subcontinent, southern China and southeast Asia as we saw in the discussion. Here, statement number 2 is incorrect. Sambar deer is the state animal of Odisha. And also know that black buck is the state animal of Andhra Pradesh. Statement number 3 is also incorrect. It is listed as vulnerable in the IUCN red list and not endangered. Here the question is asking for the incorrect statement. So the correct answer for this question is option B, 2 and 3 only. Question number 3. Consider the following statements regarding Ahum dynasty. Statement number 1. The first capital of Ahom dynasty is Charaidyo and the last and final capital of Ahom dynasty is Gargawan. Statement number 2. The battle of Saraigat was fought between the Ahoms and the British. Which of the above statements is RR correct? See here, the statement number 1 is incorrect. The first Ahom king, Sugafa, established Charaidyo in the year 1253 AD. After him, the later Ahom kings established Another four capital cities, one at Charagua, then at Gargawan, and then at Rangpur, and finally at Jorgat. 
So, the last capital is Jorgat and not Gargovan. Here, the statement number 2 is again incorrect because the battle of Saraigat was a naval battle between the Mughals and Ahoms. Although weaker, the Ahom army tried and defeated the Mughal army by brilliant use of terrain and clever diplomatic negotiations to bide time. They also used guerrilla tactics and psychological warfare. So, the correct answer here is option D, neither 1 nor 2. Question number 4. Consider the following statements regarding the Enforcement Directorate. Statement number 1. Directorate of Enforcement functions under the Ministry of Finance. Statement number 2. The headquarters of the Directorate of Enforcement is at Delhi and it has 5 regional offices. Which of the above statements is RR correct? Here the first statement is correct. In 1950, the administrative control of the Directorate was transferred from the Department of Economic Affairs to the Department of Revenue. Now this Department of Revenue is under the Ministry of Finance. Statement number 2. This is also correct. The Directorate of Enforcement with its headquarters at New Delhi is headed by Director of Enforcement. There are five regional offices, one at Mumbai, then at Chennai, Chandigarh, Kolkata and Delhi. And they are headed by special directors of enforcement. So here the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Question number 5. This is the quiz question for you. Read it carefully. Interested aspirants can post the answer in the comment box below. Displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment box below. If you have found a video to be useful, like the video, subscribe to the channel. Happy learning!